again, thank you for that introduction. And I'm excited to be here to share how we at the Home Depot went about refreshing and enhancing our customer experience in one of our categories. And that category happens to be paint. So many of you have probably been inside of one of our stores. You go to the store, you wanna purchase paint, you pick out your color, your sheen, whatever you need, you take it to the paint desk. It's mixed for you, you get a label and you go through a point of sale system and you pay for it. Well, that system that we had a few years ago happened to be very old, was, was starting to age. And anytime you're dealing with legacy architecture, legacy infrastructure and technologies, it becomes harder to support, harder to maintain and even harder to make enhancements. So a few years ago, we started the journey of redesigning our system and really modernizing the technology stack that it runs on. And this is the system that our associates use in the stores when they are mixing that paint for our customers. So as part of this, you know, when we initially, the original paint system was done years ago before we even thought about what the interconnected customer experience looked like. So now that we were in a place where we're modernizing what we have, we also took the time to relook at that interconnected customer experience to say, how can we take this beyond our stores and allow our customers who are not in our stores to purchase paint? So we took the time to lay out a plan and in order to pull this all together, that plan involved multiple teams across Home Depot. And we knew it would take multiple months for us to implement something like this. But then came 2020. And uh, 2020 impacted all of us who were on this call in many different ways. But what we really saw with 2020 is that there was a change in customer expectations and customer shopping patterns. So no longer, you know, I'm one of those, I love the touch and feel and to be able to look at something, but um, that ability kind of went away during part of 2020. And people who were hesitant to shop online now started getting more comfortable to shop online. And so we knew that even when it comes to selling paint, we had to pivot and we had to change to address the customer needs and the, the industry changes that were happening right in front of us. So the challenge, you know, the, the challenge is still there, delivering an enhanced interconnected ex experience for our customers shopping for paint, a mouthful. But the stuff on the right of this slide, I, I liken it to if you've ever played Mario Kart, it's a pretty simple goal. If you're driving, you need to do your laps and get to the end of the line. Well, while you're doing that, there's a lot of things that get thrown at you that can kind of deter you or can slow you down. And so we had the challenge of, of just taking this system and enhancing it so that it includes the interconnected experience. But then we also had the things such as what I defined as months, that was no longer happening in 2020. We had to pivot quickly and that need turned into weeks. We also needed to work with multiple teams that have had other priorities. So, you know, it, in, a, in a large company, a lot of different teams are working on a lot of different priorities. And even as 2020 came, some of those priorities had to change as we were working in the middle of a pandemic, um, working to address customer needs and, and working to address associate needs. So as part of this challenge, we needed to make sure that we could pivot together to make sure all needs were met. We were dealing with a solution that involved multiple technologies. So on the previous slide, you saw a little bit of what our, our paint architecture looks like, but now you're dealing with other systems that are different ages, have different technology stacks, and we had to figure out a way, how do we implement this and still make sure that the, the coding experience, the quality of the code is, is, is high quality and exactly what we need. So I mentioned 2020, you know, we're all sitting at, in our homes and we're dealing with new tools for collaboration. So the days of coming into an office, uh, getting into a room, going to the whiteboard, pulling out your stickies and your marker, that changed for us. And we had to figure out how do we still enable that type of innovation, that type of thinking, that type of excitement, but from our homes, you know, what tools could we use to get this done? And then of course, we're navigating through personal challenges. So people who had children, you know, the typical day you may have children and you send them to school or daycare, you come to work, you can focus. 
now school was happening in the same room where people were trying to work. You know, we're, we're navigating through uh, the learning curve of just how do we use the, the new collaboration tools to have these meetings. And while, you know, a child may be screaming in the background or a lot of you remember the early days when we were learning to use these technologies and, you know, the can everybody please go on mute or, you, you know, we can't see you or we can't hear you. So all of the personal challenges that were also happening, we had to figure out how to navigate through all of those things. So for me, you know, when I go into something that is extremely challenging, it's like I have to take a deep breath in and exhale first. So these were the three things I kind of told myself going into this. Number one, I'm going to rely on the experts and make sure we function as a team. So Sapphire mentioned earlier that I, I have a background in architecture. And the really cool, exciting thing about architecture is that you know a lot. And when you know a lot, there's a level of confidence that I'm going to do this right. You know, I'm going to make sure we don't uh, have any gaps. I, I know how all the systems work. But in this case, I could not function at that, as that person. And so I had to tell myself, it's going to be okay to rely on the other people who are experts in those areas, and we will function together as a team. I'm also a planner. You know, I, I will unashamedly admit that I plan even my vacations. So, you know, I told myself, I am going to continue to be a planner, but embrace the challenges that come out of this experience. And what I've learned about challenges is that a lot of times they birth the greatest innovative things. Um, so I told myself, keep to the plan, but as challenges come, just to be open to them and, and be okay with pivoting if necessary. And then I told myself, no matter what the obstacle is that we hit, I'm going to figure out a way around it. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to, you know, just kind of go back into a turtle shell and be nervous, but I'm going to have confidence in myself that I will figure it out. And so it started with me taking the big thing and really breaking it into several little things. So the customer experience is a, the number one place where we start it, with what we do. What will this customer experience look like? We already have Vopus and that's buy online, pick up in store. We already have that functionality for uh, a lot of our products in the store, but how does that look for the customer wanting to buy paint, purchase paint? How do they visualize the colors and, and whatever else they need to visualize? How can they do this? online and, and on their personal devices. And so we spent some time really mapping out what that customer experience should look like. The data flow. So uh, again, I mentioned that we have many systems that we needed to integrate with to make this experience work. And so taking the time to understand what are the data needs for all of these systems? How do we flow the data, whether it's a cloud system and then um, down to on-prem, how do we make sure the data gets where it needs to get? UI enhancement. So we talk about the customer experience, but in order for the customer experience to be excellent, we have to make sure our associates have the tools that they need. So what were the UI enhancements that we had to make both for our customer and for our associates that are now you know, mixing paint for customers that are no longer in front of them? So the, the normal experience, you're a customer, you come into the store, you're standing there in front of them as, as they're mixing it. But what does that look like for our associates who now have to also manage orders that are coming in from online? Back in enhancements. So uh, I'll tell you a secret about myself. Uh, in my early coding days, I hated UI coding. To me, it was uh, just too simple and clean. I love the nasty back end stuff, the complexity. So, you know, it was really exciting to think through what are all of the back end enhancements that we need to implement in order to make sure systems are integrating with each other the correct way. And so we, that was one of the areas we focused on. And then last but not least, this is a huge one, testing. So the team, my team that supports paint, you know, when we were in the office, we're right next to the testing lab. So you could code something and just look over to the side and go over to the testing lab and see how it works. But now we're all remote. So how are we going to test these changes? And it even becomes more complex because it's not just the paint system. 
It's also the changes we had to make in online and the data flow and everything we talked about. How do we glue all those things together? And so this was the approach that I took, taking something that felt big, but breaking it down into something little. And you could probably take some of these things and break them down even further. But what it did is it helped me to focus and, and helped me to navigate through something that just seemed very big in the first place. Frequent communication was key. So, um, you know, again, when you're in the office, when you see each other physically, if you have a question, you can walk over to someone's desk. You can um, look over someone's shoulder to see what the code is doing. Um, you can talk to someone in person if you have a question. We had to figure out how to enable that type of communication when we were all remote. So I know some people hate meetings. You know, I'm one that's, you know, why are we having a meeting to talk about the meeting that's going to happen? But in this case, it was necessary. Again, we had multiple teams, multiple engineers, product managers, all working towards the same goal. But how do we stay aligned? You know, how, we are, how are we going to understand what obstacles are coming uh, forward, where we need to pivot? So we had uh, daily meetings. We had meetings um, on virtual tools, but we also would send out summaries, email summaries, just to make sure that we all stayed aligned on what was going on and the status of the work that we were doing. And then there's always the goal of making sure that we stay agile and innovative. And so it can be very tempting when, when you know what the end goal looks like to just go forward and, and wanna get to that end. But we had to take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we remain agile in this environment? Are there components that we can start to build and start to test out before the whole thing is turned on? And then remaining innovative um, just in how we were building this and how we were working together, but also innovative in um, thinking about the customer experience. Is this a experience gonna have to change within a few months? You know, how do we enable the customer who still wants to come into the store? You know, whether you're online or whether you're in the store, how do we make sure that all of these things work together? So we had to challenge ourselves to constantly get to a place where we were open to pivoting and changing and, and rethinking through things if it didn't seem like it was going to work out. And so I won't go through all of this on the top, um, but that at a high level, that is what we implemented. And I'm excited to say, you know, I talked about when we mapped something out on a plan, it looked like months. And then we find out, okay, your months now has to turn to weeks. And we were able actually to get this done at least a week ahead of schedule. So it was very exciting um, for me to, to work with the team and to see that you know we were able to do more than what we thought we could do and accomplish the goal ahead of schedule. So we continue now to test and learn with what we have, you know, learning from the customer experience, learning, you know, by looking at the data behind the scenes. What does that experience look like if they pick the wrong color? You know, how, how does the returns process work for them and how can we enhance the entire experience? So as we continue to push this out to more stores, we're continuing to learn. And, you know, the getting to the pilot, getting it to a store was exciting, but it's also just as exciting to learn from what you put out there and to modify it based on what you're seeing the needs are from the customer and from the associate. So I started off in, in this conversation talking a little bit about when I was going in, my approach that I was going to take. And I do want to end talking about my personal takeaways from this experience. So the first one, don't be afraid when you don't have the full picture. Have confidence that you will figure it out. Again, going back to being a huge planner, sometimes when you have to plan something or you have to lay it all out, when you can't see the full thing, it can be intimidating. But have confidence in yourself that you are a problem solver. You can figure this out as you go. You can learn to be innovative in the middle of the process. And it's okay to rely on the experts. Help is good. You, uh, that, that is one that's funny because, you know, again, like I said, I love being the expert. And you have to remember that even when you are not the expert, you are still problem solving. And as engineers, that's probably the most exciting thing for all of us. 
So it was okay for me to rely on the experts to pull this all together and understand that this is a team thing, not a me thing. And don't be afraid to pivot if something isn't working. Uh, there's a term, you know, some people like it, some people don't, but the fail fast. I didn't like it when I first heard it, but what it did is it made me feel comfortable. If I don't get it right, get up and try something else. In fact, you learned something from that. You, you figured out something that didn't work and you can possibly change and, and go a different direction. So I, you know, this talk was not extremely long, but hopefully you found something to take away from it of you know, when there's a, a big problem that you're going after, you're, you're working on solving this big problem, um, there's a way to just get over it and to break the things down into little things that you can work on. And I, and I want to say thank you. I know I have some team members who are probably on the call, but thank you because, again, it's always a team effort when you're working on solving a problem. And huge thanks to my team that also made it happen. And I can stop sharing. Thanks so much, Felicia. Um, I think that's some really great insight. And I think uh, that's not only is it good insight, but I feel like a lot of people haven't been able to get enough space yet from what just happened with the pandemic. So I really appreciate you being able to come in and, and articulate already uh, some of those things that we were experiencing ourselves. Um, I think the team part is really important. Me and Sapphire were thrown together earlier this year. We didn't know each other everything was virtual, wouldn't have made it through this year without her. <laughs> um, so it's really key to be passing back and forth those communication pieces for sure. Yeah, again, yeah, thank you so much, Felicia. That was a really inspiring talk. And it was really interesting to hear how you and your team refreshed the customer shopping experience and what you implemented, accomplished. Um, such a huge goal ahead of time as well. So that was really, really good. And I love the three key takeaways that you gave at the end as well. So um, yeah, don't be afraid when you don't have the full picture, have confidence that you will figure it out. That's really, really great tip to take away and learn from your experience. And the other one was it's okay to rely on the experts, help is good. And then the last one was don't be afraid to pivot something. Um, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to pivot if something isn't working. So three great key takeaways at the very end. Um, there's a question, we're gonna head over now to the fireside chat. Um, the first question I wanna ask you today, Felicia, is what is involved in your daily job and what does your title actually mean? So I am a technology director. And if you ask my girls, I have three girls, if you ask them what I do all day, they say you, you talk to people and you answer emails, but it's a little more involved than that. So uh, as a technology director, we have product experiences that we are responsible for and making sure that we support our, um, our business needs through technology. So there's kind of four ways that I split my, and, and maybe it's probably more of a weekly thing and not so much of a daily, but there's four areas that I focus on in my role. One is kind of the, the tactical day-to-day, -day, you know, how are we supporting the systems that our associates and our customers are using? And just making sure that we're building solid, qual high quality performing, high performing systems. Um, there's also the part of looking forward, the, the roadmap of this is what we have today, but where is the industry actually moving? So I spend some time just trying to understand the industry the newest technologies and what we should be looking for as a team. I also, you know, as a leader, I also lead other leaders. So I spend time in personal development with those leaders. How do I enable them to be the best leaders that they can be? And then um, this, this is last, but it should not be last because I get in trouble all the time for it to be last is me. I actually have to carve out time for my own personal growth. And um, that's a lot of, a lot of times we miss that. We focus so much on a day to day that we miss, you know, what is my role? How do I continue to grow in this? So I, I do want to call that out. I actually have to carve out time to say, okay, what does my future look like? And what do I need to do to make sure I get to that future? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a really interesting piece that is challenging as you grow in your role, especially when you can be super team focused um, and especially in crisis moments like this. 
But um, now we have kind of a better understanding of what your job is overall. For you, what's like your favorite part of your job? Like what's the best thing you do? <laughs> I love complexity. Um, it, it's kind of weird, but I think there's a part in all engineers that, you know, if it's too easy, we don't get the gratification we're looking for. So the favorite part of my job is when something gets put in front of me and it's too, it looks too complicated, but I'm able to break it down and I'm able to fix it. I, I don't really spend a lot of time coding, but secretly sometimes when issues come towards my team and someone reaches out to me and say, hey, we see this issue going on, sometimes secretly I'll go into the code. I get to read it and, and see what's going on and make recommendations. But even outside of the code, um, some, sometimes it's just design. You know, we talked about, when we talked about implementing paint, we're, we're integrating with some systems that are old, some systems that are new. And so the interesting part of my job is it never gets boring because nothing is just, you know, easy at the Home Depot, but that's what makes it very exciting. I don't have to watch the clock all day long to say, oh my gosh, is it time to, to log out? It's like the day just goes by so fast because for me, I get really excited about solving problems. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And yeah, your role is very interesting and in what the work do, what the employees do at the Home Depot is really, really inspiring. And I think that it's amazing and I want to say like it's, I think it's I love the way you still go into the code and um, see what see what's up I'm sure people when you step up into role when you use the code you kind of miss looking at the code so <laughs> yeah the funny thing is is um they turn off my access after a while. and then so when I go back in I have to request access again and I'm like they're probably like why are you in the code <laughs> oh that's funny oh but yeah um I had to bring up as Funny. But the next question I would like to ask you is, um, can you tell us about a key moment in your career that has shaped you to how you how you approach your work today? Um, that That's a great question. So I shared a little bit about um, when I was an architect for Green Store Systems. When I started at the company um, years ago, that's where I, that's where I was planted. And I kind of just blossomed in that area. And then I had a leader at, at one point that came through and said, you really need to, you know, get out of this area. And um, I didn't do it. I didn't want to. I was happy where I was at. And uh, he took it upon himself to do it for me. And he kind of changed my domain and what I was over. And it was scary. It was a very scary moment. But it was also a, a very uh, life defining moment. And I, I think um, that kind of pivoted who I am today because I, I was able to eventually wrap my head around it, embrace the change and the jump right in. And so what it did for me is show me, you know, just jump in. If something changes, you know, take a moment to digest it and jump right in. And then I've had plenty of opportunities to practice that since then. But, you know, I had been in store system probably at least 10 years, if not longer than that, before my role changed. I'm over in merchandising now. But that was a pivotal moment for me because I would have never done it on my own. Um, thankfully, I had a leader who forced me into it, but I, it changed me forever. Yeah. Um, I think that's like... Uh it's always interesting to hear what those those kind of key moments are for folks. Um, but outside of that, outside of these kind of unique experiences, what do you think some key skills are for someone who wants to move into your kind of area of work? Like what kinds of skills should be, they be working towards um, aside from having life-changing moments? <laughs> um. Some of the key skills that I think are necessary, be a good listener. Um, when you're hearing about um, whether it's a problem that has to be solved or a situation that's happening, um, take the time to listen first before you jump right in and solution it. Sometimes it's really quick. To, it's easy to jump in and do what you you like to do in solution. But step, take a step back, listen to what the problem is and make sure you are really solving for the problem and not just building something that's like a Band-Aid. 
I also think communication is key and um, communication, I, I want to tie it with relationships because it, I mentioned I had to rely on the experts. The only reason I knew who the experts were was because I had relationships with them. And uh, sometimes um, it's, you know, I'm an introvert. I will just say I'm a very high introvert. And, you know, years ago, if just give me my coding assignment, let me sit in my cubicle and leave me alone. Don't talk to me. <laughs> and I had to grow out of that. I had, I had to learn to meet other people and, and to communicate with other people and be comfortable. So I would say communication is key. Having relationships is key, but also being resilient. Um, I learned I will mess up, you know, but I think the person who is not afraid to take risks is the person who will really just be successful in life. So I had to be okay with um, taking risks and not beating myself up if it didn't work out the way I expected it to be. I had to be resilient. Thanks, Felicia. There were some really good key skills to share um, with our audience today. Um, particularly um, being a, being a good listener, I think it's really good, you know, to take that step back as well and not try and solutionize things so quickly. Just try and listen at the beginning um, instead of jumping in. So that's a very key skill definitely to have and communication is key, definitely. Um, and being resilient and having those good relationships as well with your employees and like, sorry, with your colleagues and people you work with. Um, so the, the last question of what we want to ask you today is, um, do you have any tips or resources you can share with us today? I know you shared a, a, so much with us already, but is there anything else you would like to share? Oh, wow. Um, I will say as a, as a tip, there's two things that um, I really haven't talked about, but I think are huge. Read, 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 and read, and, and just continue to absorb it and not so much I'm talking about like novels and stuff like that, but information, um, just understand what are the latest trends. Don't ever get disconnected with how the world is moving forward. But then also make sure you connect with people who believe in you, whether it's a mentor, um, whether it's a sponsor, get someone who's going, you know, with someone who's going to challenge you to grow in your career. Again, I mentioned, you know, as a coder, I was very comfortable where I was at. I actually had leaders, multiple leaders who would come and talk to me. Have you ever considered leadership? You know, you you seem like the person who would be great as a leader. And I said, mm, I'm not sure it's something I want to do or can do. But when you get with a mentor, a lot of times they see uh, those things that you can't see in yourself. They see the strengths and they can help you navigate through whether it's fear or just you just completely not understanding how to get to it. So find a mentor that can help you navigate through your career. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to the recording of this because I'm going to sit and, and go back through this and uh, uh, synthesize. I hate that word, but that's, that's what I'm going to try and do, connect it to everything. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to add, Sapphire, before we uh, open the floor to some questions? Um, no, I just want to say, like, thank you so much, Felicia, like, you shared a lot with us today, and like Naomi said, I'm going to definitely be watching over this recording as well, and I can't wait to share it with everyone who couldn't make it with us today, too. Um, it will be available on YouTube, so Naomi and I will be posting this here onto the Slack channel um, to let you know when it's available, if, for anyone else that wants to watch it again afterwards. Yeah, and I don't see questions in the Q&A, but I feel like a uh, quiet room is often uh, the most engaged room. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, or I think we can probably even unmute you and, and let you just ask a question. We've got some thank yous in the chat. Yeah, we have a lot of thank yous.
So we've got a question coming in from Julio to tell us a bit about software engineering in general at the Home Depot and what opportunities there are for career mobility. So like when you came into Home Depot, did you start at that level or did you start somewhere else in Home Depot? I um, came in right from college. So I started at the, at that time, I think I was called an associate software engineer or something like that. This, it started as a, a developer and um, there are multiple paths for engineers and especially in software engineering. So um, you can come in, you know, as a coder, but there, I, I would describe some of the different paths in software engineering. There's the traditional engineering path where you can grow in, in your technology span and um, possibly move into a higher, uh, want to call it a higher role in leadership, but still with a very strong focus on technology. So we have principles and um, distinguished engineers. That's a, a growth opportunity for people who love to stay technical. And then there's always, you know, you can start as an engineer and then decide you want to go into leadership and, and go into management. And there's always opportunities to do that. I, I tend to love when you have a, a leader who has been a coder because you can relate very well. And sometimes engineers feel like I don't have the people skills. I can't do this. But there's always growth opportunities and people that can help you navigate getting to that area if that's where you want to be. We also have a product management. Um, they work very closely with our uh, business partners to really understand what are the problems that we need to solve. And uh, this is my product area and, and how does it grow? Uh, how does it relate in the industry and, and how do we grow this area? We also have uh, UX, uh, U user experience designers, I call them the UX designers, and um, the, they kind of focus in two different areas. When we talk about what that customer experience looks like, they, they're the, they can understand visually what's going on and how the customer may want to navigate through something, but they also understand the research side. You know, they, they understand, you know, how are they using this app? How are they feeling about this app? And what do we need to change? Is it navigation we need to change? Or do we need to change a screen because the customer is not getting the information they need? So there's uh, just tons of opportunities and, and tons of pathways at Home Depot. And we're always hiring. So you can go out to homedepot.com, I believe it's slash careers. And um, you can see what openings are out there. Great, thanks. Um, as you're chatting, a few questions came in. Azima is curious, um, how do you make sure your manager is looking after your interests as they're deciding kind of where to put you next? If that's kind of the thought process of a manager, but yeah, I'll leave that to you. So I, I, would, I would say, I would reverse it a little bit and say, don't rely on your manager to look out for you. Um, it goes back a little bit when I was talking about a mentor you also want to uh, have a sponsor. And a sponsor is a little different than a mentor, but a sponsor is the one who is looking out for you, looking at those opportunities and then uh, saying your name, saying, hey, I believe Felicia is ready for this. How can we get her into this role? Sometimes your manager is a sponsor. You know, my manager that, who I report to right now, she is one of my sponsors and I, and I trust her. I know that she looks out for opportunities for me. But sometimes your, your manager may not be your sponsor and it's okay, it's, it's not a bad thing. I would just say have frequent communication with your manager on what your desires are. So if you're trying to um, get into management, make sure your manager knows, but then also don't be afraid to have relationships with other people because uh, sometimes it's about uh, someone else may be in a room someplace and can bring up your name when, when your manager is not in that room. So it, you know, like I said, I reverse it a little bit. Your manager is a great resource, but make sure that you also have a sponsor. And, it, and I've had people ask me before, how do I get a sponsor? I don't have an answer for that. It has always happened for me organically, but I have signed up for mentors, people who I go to on a regular basis to say, hey, I have a goal. I wanna get to this level. Uh, tell me about your journey. Tell me about the steps I should be taking. And sometimes those mentoring relationships automatically turn into sponsorships. 
Yeah, I think that's really wise advice. Um, for sure, you can get into like mentorship programs, but having a mentor isn't the same as having a sponsor. Sponsors speak your name when you're not there. Uh, mentors are sometimes putting that on their CV. Not always, but I mean, these formal mentorship programs where it's not coming out of an organic relationship, I think there can be some challenges with that. Anyways, there was a question that was coming in more about the work you were doing at Home Depot, specifically during the pandemic. Um, and it says your managers and teams seem to be extremely adaptable with the way they're able to pivot and deliver software solutions for paint during COVID. Um, you mentioned some of the obstacles like not being right next to the testing lab, things like that. So how do you and your mid-level managers promote engagement within the team while everyone's remote and you're, you're kind of looking at some of these obstacles? Um, it, what I will say is when working with the team, one of the points I had on the slide was understanding personal challenges. So, you know, some of those challenges were people um, were now in the same room with their kids who are, are going to school and maybe they were distracted. And um, so maybe the typical hours, you know, we, we have core hours where teens, you know, maybe their core hours are eight to five. Well, maybe what, what we figured out is that eight o'clock time period for some people was no longer working out because they were spending so much energy and time working, um, trying to get things taken care of at home. So having empathy with what your team members are doing can help you connect and help you to even solve for how can we find a different way of doing this? We actually, I, I would give my leaders sometimes and say, hey, do I need to change my meeting hours? You know, and I did. I had one person that said, I, I'm with my child in the morning. If you could move anything to the afternoon, that works for me. And so making sure that you work, you know, you understand what they're dealing with so that you can pivot and you can navigate, help them navigate through those things and adjust on your side. So when you help them be their best and, you know, you uh, rearrange your schedule so they can focus, that's actually the, the best way to make sure the team as a whole can be successful. So uh, I, again, it's just going back to really understanding what, what's going on with them. We had people, you know, who had special setups in the office, you know, whether it's monitors or a standing desk, whatever it is. And then of course, you know, when you come home, I'm the first person that will tell you when I came home, I had no office. I had a laptop and I sat in my dining room because, you know, I was like, this is temporary. This will probably last a week or so and we'll be back. I eventually had to go get a monitor. I had to get a desk. And, and, and you had to remember that, hey, so the equipment that people were working on in the office, they may not have that same equipment. We had people who had Wi-Fi issues. They, you know, it, it, their, their Wi-Fi was slowing down. And the more you understand about what people are dealing with, the more you can help them navigate. And, and when you make them successful, you in turn will be successful. Yeah, I think that's a, a message I need to get out to a lot of, a lot of leaders at this time. Just, you know, clip that part of the video uh, <laughs> if you're okay with that. Um, I'm just looking at other kind of questions that are coming through, but I feel like some of them have sort of been answered. The one that we haven't kind of got to at all, someone's asking about, can you speak more about the role of data scientists in the data flow and CX efforts? Um, at a very high level, I can. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, but um, I, maybe I can speak to it through an example. So. When anytime we implement something, especially when the customer is involved, you have your own perception of how that experience is happening. One area that um, our data scientists are, are really helpful in and working with our UX designers is to validate what we think is happening. Um, we've had, and maybe not in paint, but in some other areas I'm in where we have a customer experience built online and we you know, you have point A and you hope that they get to point Z and then you realize they're not getting to point Z. We see all this data where people are starting something but they're never really getting to point Z. And so where the data scientists come in is that they help us to analyze, you know, where are customers falling off? Why are they falling off at a, at a certain place? And um, what can we do to change that? And, and what kind of progress are we making? Are we now going from A to F and then A to M and eventually getting to A to Z? 
So at a high level, that's an example of um, where data scientists, they work with our UX partners to understand that experience, to understand how we can get better and to really start to measure that progress. Yeah, um, no, it's a, a good high level overview of it. Um, I think that's about it with the questions, unless you see any other questions hanging out there, Sapphire. I feel like a lot of them have been covered in the conversation. Yeah, I agree. Um, we have covered a lot today and the, it seems to be that most of them have been answered. Um, Just wanna make sure we got everyone covered. <laughs> <laughs> it's so different again with the remote setting um and now we've been doing this for some months but you know in person you can kind of see someone's like oh oh i got one more but you know online we just get okay <laughs> do we get everything in here um thanks for your patience we'll we just take a look at that i think that's everything though do you want to wrap us up sapphire um, as Ema just left a lovely message there in the chat saying, um, Felicia, your message is so clear, your answers are so clear and um, precise. Thank you. Um, well, that was a lovely message. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen.